but but understanding what's important, what has to be gathered, and then analyzing that, and then processing that into a decision for your patients. That's really what being a physician is all about, right there. So that's kind of what we're going to try to do in this format of, of a lot of interaction, going through cases, trying to learn how to maybe go through that process and make those decisions. And then finally, to answer your questions. And whatever questions you have about glaucoma or the cases we're talking about or more existential than that is just, you know, future of glaucoma, future of ophthalmology, uh, that, that would be great too. Just any question you have, feel free to, to jump right in. I think as I, uh, I had to make some changes in my uh, career and kind of winding down a little bit, I'm waxing more philosophical than normal. So any, any questions you have, just feel free. So let's go ahead and, and jump in. So open angle glaucoma is our topic for today. And um, open angle glaucoma is a pretty big net. Um, and there's a lot of patients, there are a lot of patients with a lot of disease that are under that category of open angle glaucoma. So in this category, we would put ocular hypertension. We would put, of course, primary open angle glaucoma, normal pressure, and then there's a whole group of secondary but open angle glaucomas. What are some of those? The secondary but open angle glaucomas. Pseudo X. So around here, that is absolutely the most important by, by, I mean, by a long shot. There's so much pseudo exfoliation, and it'll just dominate your practice uh, around here because it's, uh, it's so common, A, and B, it can be pretty difficult to deal with. So a lot of exfoliation. So exfoliation, certainly number one. What are some of the others in that secondary open angle glaucoma category? Pigmentary, there you go. That's probably the second most important, all right? Then there's others, traumatic. There's inflammatory. Most inflammatory glaucomas uh, are also open angle, okay? And then um, the lens-induced. What is the lens-induced open angle glaucoma? Facolytic. Like facolytic, excellent. As opposed to, say, facomorphic, you know, which is more of a closed angle process, all right? So these are... A, you know, kind of a diffuse group, a, a diverse group, and there's a, you know, different pathology, obviously different clinical signs that we'll talk about. But for those, you know, if you're going to practice comprehensive ophthalmology, or certainly if you're going to be a glaucoma specialist, this is going to be most of what you do is in this category, especially if you're going to practice in the United States. Uh, most of it's going to fall within uh, th these disease elements here, okay? All right, so let's talk about then analyzing data. All right, and one of the most important, we're talking about open angle glaucoma. So um, by definition, we have an open angle. All right, we have an open angle. So let me just ask a couple of things. Uh, who can, who would like to go over these structures with us here in the angle? Any volunteers to do that? Again, there's, there's bagels at the back. Help yourself anytime uh, if you'd like to do that. Just jump right up. How about right here? What is that? trying to, to show right there? Corneal wedge. Corneal wedge. What is corneal wedge? It's right where um, decimase meets the, uh, like the, basically where the cornea ends and then ends in Schwabe's line. Exactly. That's exactly right. The endothelium there of the cornea, it just ends right there, decimase. And that is such an important kind of clinical sign. Dolly, how, do you, how do you find the corneal wedge? Like when you're doing gonioscopy, how do you go about finding the corneal wedge? Thin slip beam, put it at an angle. Right, exactly. So, so uh, that's great. You have a, th a thin slit beam, and I usually take it like one click off. You know, on the, on the slit lamp, right, which is the slit lamp is just this genius instrument, right? Mm -hmm. You can feel the clicks as you move it to the side, right? And so, you know, you might talk about one click or two clicks, and so when you're talking about different elements of the examination and doing different things, you can think of that in your mind, you know, one click or two clicks. So for me, the corneal wedge is a thin slit beam and then one click. I usually go one click to the side to allow me to get that beam. And that is such an important thing to practice and to learn how to do, because that is the, the one that will keep you out of trouble. So why is it important? Why, when does it really get important to be able to find and, and kind of distinguish that corneal wedge? Both are very lightly pigmented. Very good. That's excellent. 
other other examples, other instances? Like pigmentation shows you where you're at. For me, the most important time to break out the corneal wedge is actually when you have potentially kind of a narrow angle, and especially if you're getting, what's that pigmented line called that's up above Decimase? Sampalasis line. So you actually have a narrow angle. I would say for residents and fellows, the, the single most common, we'll call it error, in gonioscopy is not recognizing if that angle's actually closed and that's a Sampalasis line. Okay? Uh, not a pigmented TM. And so that's where that corneal wedge, so in that setting, what does the corneal wedge do? You don't get one. It doesn't meet the two, these two lines here, that one and that one. They, they never meet, right? They just dive down into the angle. Then you know that angle is actually closed. And any pigment that you're seeing is sample isis line. So, okay, very good. So we've got a uh, corneal wedge. And then what are the next structures you see here? What's what? Trabecular meshwork. Trabecular meshwork. And then you have anteriorly, you have the non pigmented. Posteriorly, you have the pigmented TM, correct? Uh, very important. This is kind of your target zone for doing things like laser trabeculoplasty, okay? And then next structure is? Scleral spur. Excellent. Scleral spur, to me, kind of defines the angle being open. If you can see scleral spur, just in a general sense, and we, we won't talk too much about classifications today, but if you can see scleral spur, you've got an opening, all right? So if you can see it 360 degrees, it's open. And then what do you have down here? Ciliary body. Ciliary body face, okay? So excellent. So those are the major landmarks of gonioscopy. We're talking about open angle glaucoma. So by definition, uh, we're going to be dealing with open angle diseases. So, what instrument do you all use to uh, do gonioscopy? I'm just curious, what do most of you have? Or do you have one? Do you own one? A bulk or mirror. Okay, the bulk, so the, the one that you hand, hand hold? Okay, excellent. Any others that would mostly people have? And that's an excellent, you know, Volk is an excellent instrument. So I, my favorite is this Zeiss for a mirror, okay? And uh, there's a couple of reasons why I like it. I'm, I'm not very tall, obviously, I have kind of a short arm. And so this allows me to kind of comfortably, for me, kind of rest my arm on the table and then use this, you know, lever arm here to kind of get up to the eye and it just kind of helps stabilize things for me. If I need a little extra, I've obviously got my lens box with me. I'll just put that lens box on the elbow and just kind of go just like that and, and, and get it done. It just helps to stabilize. And the optics of this are excellent. This is unfortunately the most expensive, but it... Uh, I do think it's an excellent one. But the, those, you know, it's whatever you get used to. If you like the ones that, uh, you know, the one thing that's nice about the, the like the volt that you handheld is you, you can spin it, right? So you can get kind of a, you know, kind of a dynamic uh, 360 degrees as you're looking through it. There are other uh, four mirrors that are, that have a handle, like there's a Posner. Volk also makes one that's a four mirror, and those are all excellent. So mostly it's kind of, they're all good. Uh, get, get used to one, okay, this is the one I like, like the best, uh, but there are others that can be used. But yeah, yeah if you're going to do glaucoma at all, you got to have a gonioscopy lens of some sort, okay? Very good. So let's just kind of, I'm going to uh, just divert here a little bit. We talked about the other kind of tools of the trade. We're talking about gathering data. So we're going to, obviously, we've got slit lamp, got a uh, gonio mirror. What kind of lenses do you like to use to look at the optic nerve? 90, okay, excellent. The most, does everyone have a 90? So 90 degree lens is kind of the lens of glaucoma care. And there are several reasons for that. It gives you, I think, just the right magnification, okay? Uh, it allows you to look through a small pupil. And so oftentimes in glaucoma, you're dealing with small, small pupils, you know? And it, it's nice to not have to dilate somebody every time. So I think a 90 is, is an essential. Now, there's, uh, I tried for a while, uh, Volk makes this wide field uh, lens, and man, it's an amazing view through that thing in terms of wide field. But I found that for me, the magnification of the optic nerve just wasn't quite enough, okay? I, th I thought I was not quite getting the detail that I needed, and so that's where the 90 comes in. It gives you more magnification than that, 
okay? Now, if you want uh, another lens like, like this, this is the Super 66 or like a 78, those are amazing. This is an amazing lens to like really just hone in on the optic nerve and you get this incredible magnified view. The only thing about it is you usually have to dilate the patient. So um, I, I like this lens a lot um, and I break it out whenever the patient's dilated, okay? And uh, I find it very useful for just really trying to discern subtle changes of the optic nerve, all right? But day to day, 90 is the one. So, you know, a gonio mirror, a 90 diopter lens, okay? Uh, you're pretty much ready to go. A 66 is great. And yes, I still have a 20 that I break out and uh, look at peripheral retinas, but 90, 90 diopter lens, okay. Any questions about that at all? So. Gonioscopy, so the way you get good at gonioscopy is just going on a lot of people. And just so, you know, when you're in the clinic and you're looking at people, um, especially if there's any question uh, about, you know, glaucoma in any way, break out your gonio lens and, and just practice going on people. And if you have any questions at all, you know, ask your, your faculty member to take a look and, and just kind of uh, corroborate what you're looking at, okay? All right, great. So that's gonioscopy, just one of the essential things. So let's now talk about some of the, the disease categories in this open angle, um, open angle group. So ocular hypertension. By definition, ocular hypertension has an open angle, okay? So any, anything that has a high pressure and a closed or narrow angle that moves into a different category. So ocular hypertension, uh, there's an open angle, there's elevated pressure. To what degree, when, when would you say that ocular hypertension kind of starts to kick in. You start saying that, that pressure is too high. What, what kind of number do you have in your mind? Mid-20s. Yeah, mid-20s. You know, like, so if you look at the normal pressure glaucoma treatment trial, which we'll talk about here in a minute, um, they had a cutoff of 24. That's kind of arbitrary, but you, you do need to have kind of something in your mind about where you might consider that, that cutoff. So, so about, up to about 22, 24, uh, we consider pretty normal. Above that, we start calling ocular hypertension. By definition, again, they have a normal visual field. They have a normal optic nerve, okay? That, that's part of the definition of ocular hypertension. So this leads us to talking about this ocular hypertensive treatment study, okay, this OATS trial. And um, I, can't, I can't emphasize enough how much we owe a debt of gratitude to the individuals that started and ran these massive clinical trials that for you all, thankfully, are just second nature. I mean, they're just part of your, uh, you know, what you hold on to for glaucoma, but they have all been introduced since I've been practicing glaucoma. Okay, so when I was in your shoes, these fundamental trials that we're gonna talk about today did not exist, okay? But the OATS trial is just so genius, and it, it, it provides so much help to us in the clinic. So why, did, why was the OATS trial done? I mean, doesn't everybody know that uh, you know, preventing ocular hypertension or lowering pressure uh, helps with prevention of glaucoma or progression? Well, yeah, we know that now, but we didn't. And so back in the day that I was just starting residency in the early 90s, there was really, there were, was kind of two camps, okay? Those that felt like, and there's some pretty important names on here. Anders Heil, you know, the inventor of the Humphrey visual field, who landed on the side that controlling pressure really didn't have any impact at all in terms of protection from glaucoma and optic nerve disease. It, you know, to you, you're, you're going, well, what are you talking about? But that's the way it was. And then there's also a very strong list over here, you know, some really well-known doctors that landed on the side of, yes, it does, yes, it does. So the one I wanna show you particularly here is just this Michael Cass. Michael Cass, a great glaucoma doctor, a long time at WashU St. Louis. He then became the force behind the OATS trial, the ocular hypertension treatment trial. And the reason these trials are so amazing is the number of patients that they recruit and then the rigor of the follow-up, okay? So this is just some, a few little characteristics. Patients were between 40 and 80. Again, by definition, they had normal fields, they had normal nerves, okay? And their untreated IOP was between 24 and 32. Why, why 32 a cutoff? 
above that, it's just too dangerous, right? I mean, you're not, it's just a little too dangerous to randomize somebody with a pressure that high uh, into a study where you're gonna watch them potentially untreated for a length of time. So 24 to 32, and uh, so that's all these patients. Now, if I ask you about the OATS trial, what are some of the kind of bottom line findings of the OATS trial? What, what do you, when you think of it, what do you take from the OATS trial? There was less glaucoma that developed in the treated patients, but um, people didn't progress immediately. Okay, all, all, that's all very true, that's excellent. So there was less glaucoma in the treated group. By how much, roughly? It's not less. It's a half. It's roughly half. Okay. So here is just just like Ariana saying. Here is the um, kind of the bottom line that in the treated group, those that got medication and were treated, the rate of progression to endpoint glaucoma was about half. Okay. But it wasn't zero, you know, they, they still progressed obviously, but it was reduced by about half, okay? And that's just kind of the, the bottom line. And yes, the, the progression was delayed, you know, it came, came down the road, uh, but that's really the major finding. And that's why, you know, when it came out, 2002, I, I don't know why I keep saying 2002, I promise I, I worked on this talk more recently than 2002, <laughs> but this study came out in 2002, all right? And um, that's, that's really the important finding. What's another, this is a clue right here, what's another just major, major finding of the OATS trial? Central corneal fatigue. Central corneal fatigue. And what did it tell us about the effect or the impact of central corneal fitness? It's like independence, uh, it's an independent risk factor from IOP. And yeah. From which is amazing, which is amazing. So. There's a great history there. So when the OATS trial was started, it was designed and, you know, the recruitment criteria and everything is a beautiful study, but actually they were into the study, into the recruitment quite a ways when a, a smaller group of ophthalmologists, mostly kind of credited with like Jamie Brandt out of Davis, said, hey, listen, we have got to measure central corneal thickness in these patients, okay? We've just got to do it. And, and so actually uh, they went back to, you know, or at some, you know, kind of future date of one of the visits, they went back and got central corneal thickness on all of these patients, okay? And so it was kind of added to, but thank goodness, because it actually, amazingly, came out as the number one predictor of advancing glaucoma of all the parameters that were looked at, even more than intraocular pressure. That's, it's amazing, and, and so, Measuring central corneal thickness is absolutely essential to managing glaucoma these days, and all of that came out of the OATS trial, all right? So just from a practical standpoint, what do you have in your minds as far as numbers and impact of central corneal thickness? What's, what's a thick cornea to you? 600. Yeah, 600 definitely. That's great. 600, I, I can't my mind about 580. I'll show you a slide here in a minute that maybe argues that. About 580 and above, that's thick, okay? And what does that mean in terms of pressure? You can allow them, in theory, to have like a ride higher. Ride higher because, you know, in the Goldman equation, um, that, you know, the, the, through which we have Goldman tonometry, a thicker cornea overestimates the pressure, right? So you have a thicker cornea, you know, actually the, the true pressure is a little lower. And I don't try to convert. I don't have, there's no formula really that works very well. I just have in my mind 580 and above, I'm, you know, I'm overestimating their pressure, okay? And then what do you have as kind of a low, what, what's a thin cornea? 500. 500, certainly. I kind of think in my mind maybe 520, 520 and lower. So 520 and lower, um, you are underestimating their pressure, right? And then everything else in the middle, you're probably pretty accurate. But it's, it's amazing, you know, that to have this number. So I would say to you that wherever you go and you're practicing and you're managing glaucoma, no matter what kind of chart or, you, you know, I'm sure you're going to have an EMR somewhere, that you have visible to you at all times that you're seeing that patient what their corneal thickness is. You know, something that's easy to look at. Like when we built the MRI, we designed that snapshot. I don't know if you all use that snapshot. 
I use that all the time. I have it up on half my screen all the time for my patients. And one of the parameters that's on there is the central corneal thickness so that, you know, when I'm trying to determine is it getting worse or not or what's the pressure and I can look at that central corneal thickness and I'm looking at that all the time, almost every visit on the patient, not only am I looking at what their pressure is, but I'm looking at what their central corneal thickness is, all right? So it's just, it's just amazing and it's so powerful. So let me just uh, show you a couple of things here. This is a graph that came out in the original publication and it basically shows the impact of central corneal thickness. Let's see, I'm not getting that point here. Um, central corneal thickness and what it does. Basically, what it allows us to do is stratify risk for a patient. It provides another variable. So look at this graph right here. Basically, this is stratifying risk based on intraocular pressure on the left. So imagine if that graph were collapsed because without the central corneal thickness, all you've got is one variable, all right? So without central corneal thickness, you would collapse that graph into just one column, okay? And if you were to do that, and I've done this before, let's say for people that have pressures of, who measures 25, 75? I don't know, it's 26 and above. <laughs> so 26 and above, if that graph were collapsed and you looked at all those numbers and I've done this, you would get a risk factor of about 18% if all you had was pressure, okay? But if you then stratify it with corneal thickness, what you're allowed to do is realize that in that group that when you're just measuring pressure is about 18% at risk for advancing to glaucoma, some of them are twice that actually, the ones with thin corneas and then some of them are a third of that if their cornea is actually thick, okay? So the power of that is really extraordinary, okay? So any, any questions about that right there? That's just such an important thing. Yes? Can I question? Um, how does it affect uh, somebody if, we, if you do refractive surgery and the cornea is thinner based on that? Would that increase the risk or is it based on their like baseline central corneal thickness that we estimate at risk? So I'm saying if you thin the cornea like it did LASIK or something like that, that is a great question that I don't think we know the answer to, okay? I, I, I don't. My gestalty is that it, if you do it with LASIK, it doesn't have quite the same impact as if that is their natural corneal thickness. Does that make sense? So, but I, there is not really good data out there. I mean, that would be a, a, a really important question to answer. But it does seem that, you know, as was said, that this central corneal thickness, the, the statisticians that worked on this data, they tried as hard as they could to, sh to show that the only reason it really matters is because of its impact on measuring the pressure, all right? But again and again and again, it kept coming out that it seems to have an independent role in predicting about glaucoma damage. So whether or not that means that there's something also wrong with your optic nerve or who knows what that means, it seems to have some independent effect other than just its effect on pressure measurement. Does that make sense? So this is just an incredibly powerful thing and why you can start to stratify risk. And we'll, sh we'll look at something here in a minute. I want to make sure not to take too long here. Now, if you do the same thing based on optic nerves, so if you're looking at larger optic nerves, okay, and their risk of moving on to glaucoma, it's the same thing that if you move everything to the left because you don't have central corneal thickness, you know, on that top category, you'd get a number there of about 14%. But you'd have no way of knowing that some of those in that same group, it's only 8%. So in my mind, when I'm seeing patients in the clinic, I kind of think about up and to the left and down and to the right because I have these tables in my mind. So, or the, these graphs, I should say. So up and left means they've got higher pressure, they've got increased cup to disc ratio, and they've got thinner corneas, okay? So if you get up in that upper left, higher pressure, higher cup to disc ratio, thinner cornea, their risk of progressing to glaucoma over five years starts to get into the 20s and 30s percent, okay? As opposed to 
just down and right. Down and right means they've got a thicker cornea, they've got lower pressure, you know, I mean, it's still a little high, but it's 24 rather than 29, okay? And they've got smaller cup to disc ratios. Those folks, their risk of progression is two to 4%, you know, so, so much difference. And that helps you so much in determining. So let's look at some kind of real world examples about how this changes things, okay? So we're gonna keep the pressure the same but we're gonna just vary some of the other variables. Namely, in this case, the cup to ratio is 0.1, thick cornea, right? So there's, there is down and right, right? They got a thick cornea, they got a small, um, they got a small cup to disc ratio, and the pressure's kind of in the middle. Their risk of five years of progression of glaucoma is just about 1%. Let's change it a little bit. Pressure's the same. A little bit higher cup to disc ratio and a kind of a normal corneal thickness. Okay, so you're kind of in the middle of that graph. You're, you're at 7% risk over five years. Change it further. This is where you really start to get up and left. The cornea is thin. The cup to disc ratio is yeah, kind of marginally high, 20%. I mean, think of the difference of that and the power that gives you when you're trying to counsel a patient about do we start treatment or not now, right? They're, they're, Cornea is 620, their cup to disc ratio is 0.2, and their pressure is 27, everything else normal on testing. That is a patient you could probably say, you know, it's probably only about a 1% risk um, to develop in glaucoma, and maybe we could just watch for a while, all right? Does that make sense to everybody? And then um, I, I want to go back here one thing. So what's one other thing that came out in the second OATS report that is so important in terms of about deciding are we going to treat or not? What did the second OATS report have to say about the impact of a delay in treatment? Any, any, anybody know that? I don't mean to play read my mind, but it actually is a really, really, really important finding. I thought that delay in treatment was okay. Yes, it did not impact the final outcome. So. The idea then is if you're going to take one of these one percenters or two percenters and you're just going to watch them, but let's say that in five years they're like the one or two percent that starts to show glaucoma and then you start treatment. There is no negative effect on, uh, of that looking long term as opposed to if you started that patient right from the beginning and treated them versus starting them five years later when they actually show glaucoma. It did not have any negative impact on treatment, so that's really important. So it gives you the power to kind of observe in some of these low-risk patients, as long as the patient's comfortable, All right? It's really, really good. If we kick up the pressure a little bit, even with a pressure of 28, with those parameters, again, we're up and left, um, you know, really low, or excuse me, down and right mostly, we're mostly low, it's like 2%, okay? All right, any questions about ocular hypertension? Yes? So, with the results of that second, are, mm -hmm. Do we just kind of wait now to until they start showing a little bit, or do you start treating before? So that's that's a great question, and that's one of the points that I I really want to emphasize today. And here in a little bit, we're going to talk about it even more, and and that is about in glaucoma. In glaucoma, you want to form this kind of partnership with the patient, okay? And those are some of the decisions that are going to make, not just entirely based on what you might think, but what the patient feels comfortable with. You're going to find patients who, in, that, in the exact same setting, you're going to tell them, you know, it, you're about 1% or 2% over the next five years of developing glaucoma. Some patients are going to say, well, I still want to treat it. Okay, I just, I just you know, it drives me crazy. I, I, can't, I can't go with this pressure of 26 or 27 and not treat it. And you're going to have others that say, I don't, want to, I don't want to do that. I don't, want to, I don't want to start drops now, okay? And what you can then say is that either one of those options, based on the data, this incredibly powerful data, you can say either one of those options is okay, right? Either one is okay because you know that delaying the treatment, even if they turn to glaucoma, it's going to be okay, all right? And uh, to not treat them is fine, but to go ahead and treat them is also fine, all right? So it's that collaborative partnership, which I think is so important in treating glaucoma. So that's a great question. Yeah, it's also interesting that in the OATS population, you have age, which I know is a big risk factor. Yeah. But like if you took a 90-year-old with the same otherwise characteristics as a 60-year-old, 
Yeah. A nine-year-old would have a higher risk of developing glaucoma, but who would have a higher risk of like losing vision in their lifetime? That's right. Isn't that, isn't that true? Uh, that's such a that's such a key point. That's really astute. Um, I had a I had a patient the other day, uh, not the other day, like yesterday, who asked me that basically that same question. You know, they said, well. What do you think my risk of going blind is if I don't treat? And, and, and that's, that's really the crux of the matter, right? That's what we're trying to do, we're trying to have you die with vision. And that sounds terrible, but you know, I, have, I have patients all the time that you know, we get their obituaries. I, I deal with a lot of patients that are really old. I've been here a long time, so a lot of our patients pass away. And, and I immediately just think, what, you know, were, were they seeing? Yes, they were seeing. OK, you know, victory. We'll take that. Um, but, the two things, you know, if you could, so I told this patient, okay, so I need two variables here. If I knew exactly what your life expectancy was, how long you were going to live, and if I knew exactly the rate of progression of your disease, and if those two were ever going to cross, I could, I could counsel you perfectly on whether or not we need to start treatment right now. But I don't know either one of those, so we just make our best kind of judgment based on, but life expectancy, absolutely. I have, I have several, you know, 95-year-old people who if they were 65, we'd be doing surgery on, but they're 95 and we've, we've together, they and I, we have together decided we're just gonna take the drops and, and take our chances here that my vision's gonna outlive me, okay? So that's really a great point. Okay, so normal pressure glaucoma. What, what kind of thoughts do you have normal pressure glaucoma? What are, the, what are just some of the connotations that you get when you, uh, when you think about that diagnosis? It's frustrating. Man, it's like these are the patients that will just keep you up at night, okay? Their pressures are 12 and they are getting worse, you know? It's just, it is just something else. So that's really, really true. Very frustrating. Think about perfusion. Yeah. You, 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 there's got to be something else, right? I mean, these patients that are their pressures are so low, and they're just getting every time they come in, their their visual field's worse and they're worse, and their pressure is nine. There's got to be something else other than pressure. But we're going to talk about. We know pressure plays a role, but perfusion, genetic susceptibility, some type of abnormality in their optic nerve or something, there's got to be something else, but there's not many of those variables we can control, all right? But that, those are great points. Any other thoughts about normal pressure glaucoma? Well, from translational research data, there was a guy who was a postdoc or a grad student, grad student, he would talk on the channels, and he was, yeah. I asked him after about normal pressure glaucoma and how they think these channels are acting in that, and he was talking about, uh, like you're saying, like increased um, sensitivity in the channels in normal pressure glaucoma, so just more susceptible, more reactive. Yeah. Yeah, it, that is uh, super exciting research that they're doing there, and that's really one of the fundamental questions that they might hopefully can maybe answer for us, okay? So, again, by definition, there's an open angle. Pressure is you know, it's a little bit arbitrary, but let's say it's not greater than 22, okay, that's in the untreated state, all right? And they have, again, we've got glaucoma here, so they have a visual field defect. So let's talk about uh, some of the most important things. We, I, I know I emphasize these studies a lot, uh, uh, you're probably sick of hearing them, but they're very exciting to me because they have come out since I've been in practice, and they have absolutely just reshaped glaucoma practice, okay? So the Baltimore eye study is one that we're going to talk about, and then this normal tension glaucoma treatment trial. So the Baltimore eye study, here is the bottom line slide right here. The, um, the Baltimore eye study was published in the very early 90s. I was just starting my residency. And again, I mean, you just have to admire the effort. Like 7,000 patients that got full exams, okay, including visual fields. So just think of that effort. And what they were wanting to know is the prevalence data of glaucoma in a Baltimore population. Okay, this all this is done at Wilmer, so it's kind of surrounding Wilmer. And uh, just looking at the, pre uh, the incidence and prevalence of glaucoma. And these two slides, the one on the left represents treat patients who were untreated, meaning they, they didn't know they had glaucoma, okay? The, um, 
the, uh, the one on the right is people who were uh, already treated. So already knew that they had glaucoma. So they're still comparing their pressure. And you've got the, um, the upper graph represents African-American patients. The uh, lower line represents Caucasian patients. So let's just look at this for a minute. What they found, uh, again, um, remember, we're at early 1990s. We are still trying to establish whether or not pressure even played a role in glaucoma, something that seems so obvious to you. But what they found is that um, as pressure increased, the prevalence of glaucoma clearly increased, okay, <laughs> without a doubt. And look what happens when you start getting up to around 25, but especially if you get to, you know, say a pressure of 30 or so, okay? The incidence just really shoots up. And notice how it shoots up so drastically in African-American patients, okay? Um, and this, so the main findings of the Baltimore Eye Study are, number one, prevalence of glaucoma increases as pressure goes up. Again, this is 30 years ago. That was very important information, number one. Number two, that, that those curves are exaggerated in African-American patients, okay? And if you can look, if you look at African-American patients that have a pressure of 26 or above, I mean, look what happens to that prevalence. You're up to one in 10, even one in eight have glaucoma, okay? Now, the other really important finding of this study is subtle, but it's right there. What happens to these graphs as you go down towards the lower pressure end? Becomes negligible. But yeah, it's just kind of a smooth curve going down there, okay? There's not like another spike suggestive of this separate disease down there that's normal pressure glaucoma. D does that make sense? I mean, if normal pressure glaucoma were this kind of independent thing, one might expect that as you go down those curves, you would see another kind of blip of prevalence, but you don't. It's just this smooth curve down, okay? So that kind of came to argue that maybe normal tension glaucoma was just part of open angle glaucoma in general. And it's just, you know, they, they had the glaucoma, but their pressure was never high. So a lot of that information led to this study. Now, I really put, want to put this up here, 1998. So 1998, this was the first study of these major you know, NIH-funded trials that were conducted in a very rigorous way to be published, 1998. I started, I did my fellowship here with Alan, 95. I started here, faculty, 96. So this is two years into my practice this was published. And it really was the very first large trial that showed, without a doubt, that pressure, intraocular pressure, was part of the pathologic process of glaucoma, even in patients that we classified as, quote, normal pressure, glaucoma patients, okay? So the randomization of this is a little bit tricky. They took 140 eyes of 140 patients. They were randomized, but they didn't get randomized until after they showed progression or the glaucoma split fixation right at the start. So these are, these are naive patients. These are patients that are just getting diagnosed with glaucoma. They are not treated patients, right? These are naive patients and they are diagnosed with glaucoma and then they are consented to the study and then they are put in the study and then they are followed until they progress documented progression. So they watched them until they got worse. So these are kind of the worst of the worst in terms of their glaucoma because the pressure's low and they're getting worse and we've documented it. And then we're going to randomize them. And we're going to randomize them either to no treatment or a 30% lowering of pressure, okay? The 30% number is a little bit arbitrary, but it was picked to say that most of these patients were going to get surgery. So it's interesting, we don't think of it that way, but the normal tension glaucoma treatment trial is actually, it's kind of a surgical treatment study as well, all right? So they get randomized after they've worsened, 30% lowering or not, most of these patients got surgery to achieve that 30% lowering. Going back to the Oates trial, what was the amount of pressure lowering in the Oates trial with medicine? Those that were treated? 22%. 20, yeah, 22%, excellent. So this is more than that. Okay, we're going to lower it by more than that. 
bottom line right here. Of the control eyes, the ones that were untreated, 35% of them progressed again, okay, during the, after randomization. Only 12% of eyes that had pressure lowering of 30% progressed. Highly significant. The conclusion was that pressure is absolutely part of the pathogenic process, even in normal pressure glaucoma. But generally speaking, it just gave us data that lowering the pressure in a patient with glaucoma worked, okay? It protected them from advancing, even in this group. Now, if you go back, and this is just an important point, if you go back and use the original baseline, you know, before they were actually randomized, but their original baseline, before they got surgery, and if you use that baseline, the effect of IOP was only found after cataract impact was taken out. Why? Well, the way they used to do surgery back then, a lot of these patients got cataract after getting trabeculectomy, okay? And, and that would obviously affect their visual field, so they had to kind of factor that out, either by taking the cataract out or by using the, you know, the algorithm that kind of accounts for cataract effect, okay? But the bottom line is the lowering pressure protected these patients. So, conclusions. From normal pressure glaucoma treatment trial, lowering pressure works. 1998, first time we actually held that in our hand, without a doubt, lowering pressure works. Another kind of conclusion is kind of what we've been talking about already. Um, what about this thought paradigm? Again, this is kind of old, but I think it still holds true. That in a glaucoma patient, there are two forces that are at play all the time. And there are these pressure dependent factors and there are pressure independent factors. And as indicated on these slides, uh, the graph here, the higher the pressure goes, the more these pressure dependent factors, whatever they might be, you know, direct trauma on the optic nerve, restriction of circulation of the optic nerve, whatever that pressure causes, the role of the pressure de dependent forces goes way up, right? If you've got a pressure of 30, it's all about getting the pressure down, all right? Now, when you're down below, there are still these pressure-dependent forces at play, even when the pressure is 12. And that's why lowering the pressure even further still helps these patients. But likely, there are these pressure-independent forces that are dominant when the pressure is 12. And the, those are things like the genetic susceptibility, these channels we talked about, you know, those kind of things. So I like to think of normal pressure glaucoma in that way that there's some pressure independent forces that I can't control very much that are probably working here, but I can still lower the pressure, still good data that it's helpful. Okay? Yes? Um, but going back to the Baltimore Eye Study, yeah. uh, were the patients that are treated and not African American, do they ever comment about why there seems to be a good decrease in Yeah, uh, no, I don't have an answer for that. That's just a, that's probably, uh, I don't know if this, uh, kind of a, a fluke of observation or something. And in the treated group, right, we know they're treated, they can have variable pressure. But I don't know of any particular, you know, kind of reason or explanation for that. But that's a good, ob good observation. Okay, very good. So let's take this patient right here. We'll just talk through this patient. So a 57-year-old man, he's had LASIK in each eye. So this is one, you know, uh, I, I don't have their, uh, corneal thickness data from before, but they have had LASIK. So this patient noticed their own visual field defect, which you never like to have happen. But this patient noticed their own visual field defect, uh, went in, got diagnosed, was started on Bisolta in the right eye, and then came to us for a kind of a second opinion consult, okay? So when we first saw them, the vision was 2025, 20, 2020, pressures were 20 and 19, we couldn't find any documented pressure above 21 in any old records. I, had, I have a normal angle, so there's no secondary, identifiable secondary cause. Cup to disc ratio is about 0 0.8 and 0 0.5, uh, right and left eye. The right eye is the one where this patient notices the problem, okay? So we're gonna work them up, of course, and we're gonna get uh, visual fields that look like this, okay? So what do, you, what do you think, what goes to your mind when you see this, this scenario for this patient, visual fields that look like that? Any thoughts on what you might do next? What your what your thoughts? Uh, what your next steps would be? The reliable field is very asymmetric, but the right eye does look glaucomatous. Looks like there's superior arcuate and inferior nasal stem. 
that. Perfect. I think that's great, great analysis. So, very asymmetric. So that, you know, that kind of sets off a few bells, you know. Um, but it does look like glaucoma, doesn't it? I mean, it, that looks like a glaucoma field rather than a neural field. Um, and so, uh, we, you know, we felt the same way. And then I want to show this thing right here, this OCT. So what do you think of this OCT? Very asymmetric, um, as noted before, and it correlates with the field, I would say, yeah. just with the level of thinning. Yeah, excellent. So tell me about this right eye. What do you think about that right eye, the, just looking at that scan? What's that, I'm sorry? Just like bottomed out. Yeah. So, yes, absolutely, absolutely. So I would say, I, I put this up for this example, that right OCT to me is uninterpretable, okay? Uh, you know, whenever you see those OCTs just dipping down to zero, you know, that is, uh, that's just, un, I just, inadequate, right? There's, there's, there's an inadequate box on the readout and I just put inadequate. The reason I bring that up, because it, it is, this is so important in glaucoma, you know, there's an old saying that the only, only thing worse than making a decision based on no data is making one based on bad data. And in glaucoma management, you can get bad data. This is bad data. You, you just can't make any clinical decision based on that OCT. And you just have to be willing to ignore it. Now, thankfully, as has already been pointed out, this person does really reliable visual fields. And so this is a person that, you know, in that specialty comment section of Epic, you know, it's right there. I'm going to write in that note, don't get any more OCTs on the right eye. You know, just don't get them because they're not going to help you. Or, or something like visual fields is going to be what we, what we use in this patient. All right. So very good. Got a normal OCT on the left, uninterpretable on the right, but we do have a very reliable visual field, which is great. Thank you, at least for the first... OCT, can't you say that you can interpret that it's like certainly a thin nerve fiber layer? You, you can, but even that, I just, I almost just put it into this, I can't, I can't use this category. Yeah. Uh, would you be able to at least like, I don't know, at our, at my level, like just be able to say, oh, at least this thinning correlates with the visual field changes, making me certain that it is glaucoma versus something else? Yeah. I mean, like I said, like I say, you can try to do that, but I would be a little bit careful about that. I mean, that, that particular OCT is so not good that it's almost better to just throw it out. Now, going back, that was a while ago. Now we have a little better technology of our OCTs. You know, we can section those things out and hopefully get a better reading. But at least that one that I had right there, we wouldn't, uh, wouldn't spend much time on that one. That, that's my opinion. Does that patient have peripatinal? That's probably the most common cause of that type of OCT, is when you have a kind of a big tilted myopic nerve peripapillary atrophy, which this person does. So that's usually the reason for an OCT that's just not very useful. When you have an OCT like that, is it worth repeating one the next time they come? Just absolutely, to yeah, see? yeah, absolutely. I, that, that, you bet, repeat it, you get the same thing then for sure. But, but any, and that's true of visual, any, any of these tests, Repeating them is a really important part of, of managing and, and trying not to, again, trying not to make decisions on bad data. Um, would you also repeat an RNFL, as you, if you're following um, fields consistently, would you also repeat one like every one or two years just to make sure the left eye is not thinning? Just like sure, again, so when I say don't get any more OCTs, I'm, I'm saying right eye. <laughs> left eye, you bet. Super, super important for this. Super important, OCT, so, I'm glad you brought that up because for this patient, um, OCT for the left eye takes on even a greater significance because of the history in the right eye. I mean, and so you want to just be all over that left eye and making sure you keep protected. And so serial OCT will definitely help you with that for sure, for sure. So what do you think in this patient? What would you know? You got the, they're sitting there and you got that data, you got that history. You're just trying to put that, uh, you know, process this into making a clinical decision. For this patient, so I feel like I still want to be entirely convinced it's glaucoma and not another process like an orbital mass or something like that. I, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. 
So let me just say this, boom, and where I was normal, okay? Um, I mean, I, I, I do, I absolutely agree that that looks and smells like glaucoma, okay? The one thing about, and I, I'm sorry, I don't have a picture, but the one thing about it is, it was already pointed out, that this nerve was a little funky looking, okay? So, um, you know, I couldn't really feel like super confident that this was a glaucoma nerve. And we'll talk here in a little bit about some of the things that help us differentiate that. So yeah, we, we scanned this person. Why that asymmetry, okay, and the fact that the patient had noticed that visual field defect, you know, I mean, there was, it was worrisome. So, so we, we did scan and the MRI was normal. Okay, so now you got that in your hand. What, what might you do next? You bet, absolutely. Think of, uh, if we think in the direction of glaucoma, look if there's any secondary glaucoma, so if it's truly like primary open angle. Right, absolutely. And no evidence of secondary glaucoma in this patient. So let me just, just to refresh your memory, so we got that visual field, okay, that visual field right there, and we've got pressure of 20. Normal MRI. So, any thoughts about ramping up treatment in this patient? The 30% reduction. Yeah, I, I, I agree. You know, this is a patient that even just sitting right there in my chair, even though I don't have a lot, a lot of history of working visual fields, in my mind, that history, that visual field, and a pressure of 20 is just not compatible, okay? Not compatible. We got a normal MRI. So yeah, we decided to ramp up the treatment. So we added dorsolamitimolol, comes back with a pressure of 14. Pretty good, that's pretty good. You know, there's our 30%, right? So feeling pretty good about that. Comes back in four months later, pressure's 12 and 14. Excellent, except vision is now 2040, and it was 2025. So any thoughts on, on that? like other medications. What's that, I'm sorry? They talk about, ask about his other medications. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're really starting to, so, you know, the vision dropping with the visual field that's right at fixation, that is, a, that really starts to get, you know, you're worried about that, right? So, yeah, looking at other things, any chance they have sleep apnea, any chance they have some other contributing factor, couldn't really find anything, so, mm, we decided, let's repeat his visual field. So there's this repeat visual field. Um, the first one is the one on the right. The subsequent one is the one on the left. Any thoughts on that? Uh, inferior arch to it might be progressing. Could, yeah, could be. Let's see, the one on the left is the new one. The one on the left is May of 2020, and this one is December of 2019. So it's about five months apart. This is the most recent. They look pretty similar, but it's hard to... Yeah. The main deviation is a little bit less, but... Okay, that's a good observation. I, I mean, all that's good. They do look pretty similar. I mean, they're pretty similar, aren't they? I mean, if you're... You'd be, you'd be really uh, splitting hairs, which probably is you know, beyond what these visual fields can do, just call it worse, I think. But that mean deviation is a little worse. It yeah, is. yeah, they do have a little bit more fixation losses, yeah. but that could be due to, again, decreased visual acuity. Yeah, so that's true. This is a 2040 eye, that's, a, you know, same eye, 2040, right. 2025. Well, so yeah, the field looked about the same. Um, I put really not changed. I mean, a little bit of mean deviation changed. But man, not changed, vision 2040, Whew. okay. What do you want to do? Let, let's, uh, we decided, yeah, let's just watch this. Four months later, vision's 2050. So what do you think now? You're gonna start really looking at stuff. Let me say this, we had them go through neuro op. I mean, it's decreasing vision. We've already got an MRI, but okay, let's, let's, let's make sure we've covered all the bases, went to neuro op, got their, you know, their optic, uh, optic neuropathy workup. Uh, they, we'd already had the MRI, but they did all the blood work and everything like that. And that all came back pretty normal. So uh, the idea was we were sending the neuro op. If, if they didn't come up with anything, then we were watching that vision decrease, not liking it very much. 
what might we do? So let's say this patient did come back from neuro without any other findings. So we're talking about glaucoma and vision getting worse, but visual field kind of staying about the same. What, any thoughts on that? And he does have some cataract that's there. It's not anything drastic, but there's a, there is a little cataract there. What's that? Um, I didn't on him, I don't think, but that's a very good thought. Uh, like multiple IOP measurements throughout the day. That, very good thought, yeah, very good thought. Oh, what's that? I said and, right? Yeah. Okay. So, with that in mind, our, what is our main concern? My main concern is his vision's going down, right? His vision is going down. Even though the visual field looks about the same, he's got a cataract. Um, we talked together and, and I, I told him that I think it's possible that your cataract is causing your vision to decrease, but I'm not 100% certain. But um, I think there's a, there's a reasonable chance that your cataract is getting worse. So let's say that we're, we're making the decision together that we're gonna to do cataract surgery. Right, should we do something else in this patient? The, I, I've given a couple of options there. Should we do a phacotrab in this patient? Should we do maybe something less invasive uh, as far as uh, glaucoma procedure in this patient? I, there's not a perfect answer, but what, what, what are some of your thoughts? As you're sitting there with this person, you're trying to help them and you're trying to make it help them to make a decision. How old are they again? Uh, 57, it's about my age, oh. yeah. I'm pretty young. We're at pressure 12. I don't think makes is going to get us much lower. And okay. it's a Caucasian fusion, so Trav maybe has good chance. Okay. I, I totally agree. There's no doubt that the best chance of getting the pressure lower than 12 is a Trav. No doubt whatsoever. And if it's a younger patient, then maybe a healthier conch, like surgically, and then just longer, longer uh, benefits of actually doing this intervention. Okay. Excellent. That's very true. What would be the argument for maybe doing phaco migs, you think? If the vision gets better with the cataract, then you didn't have to uh, really, I guess, intervene that much okay. as, as drastically. And that could be a first step and you always have the conch to go back later if okay. it's not going down. So um, every, all of these answers are fantastic. Um, and they're all really, really excellent. I will say that that is what we went with. That argument right there. Okay, that my main concern in this patient was decreasing vision. And I had a stable visual field and a pressure of 12, okay? So together, he and I, we basically adopted that philosophy right there. Let's take your cataract out and let's do a, you know, a MIGS procedure and let's see what we get back in terms of vision we could always do a trabeculectomy later, okay? Now, what would have changed my mind? Well, change my mind if the pressure was still 25, or especially if I had documented visual field progression. But what, I ha what we have is vision decrease, okay? So we went with that. We did a FACO, and we did an eye stent, and we got lucky, okay? okay got vision to 2025. And I remember this fellow, because I, you know, I remember watching him, and we were, some of it was during the pandemic, and, and man, we were just having, you know, a hard time getting follow-up and stuff like that. Had to get, you know, got his surgery done. And I remember the first time he came back after cataract surgery, and that vision had improved from like 2050, 2060 to 2025. That was a really satisfying, happy day, okay? Because the other alternative is that it was his glaucoma that had worsened, that was taking away his central fixation. So to get this, and we even got a little pressure lowering, maybe just from taking, taking his cataract out. But, but anyway, that, that's, I think that's a, a, just a good example of trying to right, analyze this data and synthesize it, process it into trying to help a, a decision for your, make it help your patient make a decision, yes. So I'd read that decreased ocular uh, perfusion pressure is a risk factor for progression in normal touch of glaucoma. And uh, beta blockers can induce that as well. So would you have considered I think he was on Timolol. Would yeah. Consider switching that out. Is that something that you've seen uh, work or not working? That, that, that's a, that's a great question, and it, and it, that comes up all the time. I, I will I will just say this that in practice, 
that's not something that I've noticed that much. But what I have noticed is the benefits of lowering the pressure. And so, you know, on somebody like this, so if their pressure was like 10 or 11 and their field kept getting worse, you know, that's something that I might consider. But, but usually I think the pressure lowering in most patients, because Timolol is a great pressure lowering drug, kind of outweighs maybe any effects on blood flow. Uh, you know, th the problem with that, I mean, it's such a great question. The problem with that is that it's just so hard to measure, you know, their, their perfusion pressure or get any kind of measure of that. So it, it becomes kind of theoretic, you know. So but that, that's a great thought. All right, very good. So let's talk about uh, a different patient, okay? Uh, this is a 69-year-old Native American woman. Cataract she had uh, outside, she had cataract surgery on the outside about six weeks ago, and she had no improvement in vision. So this is the opposite of our guy. Uh, you know, you think you, she's got a cataract, her vision's going down. Um, okay, let's take that cataract out. Whoa, it did not get better at all, okay? So she came to us for another opinion. And after, the, after the, the vision didn't improve after cataract surgery, then the other doctor, you know, I mean, not, not criticizing, just got some fields and, ooh, that doesn't look very good, started on medication, and then the patient came in for an evaluation. And when we saw the patient, this is what we had. And, and let me just make another point about managing glaucoma patients. I believe that somewhere in your chart, you need to have easily accessible kind of their baseline characteristics, like the first time they came to see you, what was their vision, what was their pressure, you know, kind of what was maybe their visual field. So for me, I, again, in that specialty comment section, I almost always put in their first visit with us. Vision was this, pressure was this, um, you know, their field was this, so that I can always refer back to it. It's been shown in studies that when you're reviewing visual fields, if you only go back like two or three years in your visual fields, that you can let like this creep occur without really noticing it. But what you really have to do is go back to the beginning, you know, and go back to the very early field. So I always have this information, you know, the baseline information. So this is the baseline information we get on this patient. 2060 on the right, 2030 on the left, pressures of 10, she's on some medications, open angle. She's had cataract surgery on the right. I don't see any secondary signs of glaucoma, no exfoliation, no, no problem like that that I can see. Cup to disc is this. Macula looked okay. What do you do next? Macula looked okay here. Again, OCT. What do you think of that OCT? Yeah, you can see that up there. So difficult, I would say, I totally agree with you. Difficult, I would say this one as opposed to the other one, I would say not impossible. I think there's some usable, absolutely some usable data here. Right eye is, you know, thinned out relative to the left. There's our field. Any comments on that field? There's more pattern deviation in the, Yeah. Likely high false positives. It's not the most reliable field. You're right. It's it's not it's not perfectly reliable. Very good. Any other thoughts about that field? Do you think it does it? It doesn't look doesn't clearly glaucomatous. Yeah. yeah. It respects the vertical midline almost. Yeah, it, 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 it kind of smacks of that, doesn't it? But it's no, looking it's a little, <laughs> little potentially neurologic, right? Okay, so um, there you go. So, you know, again, you're just trying to do your best to, to make these decisions and know when to, you need to scan somebody and, and when not. But in that patient, what were the clues there? If, uh, you know, what, what are the clinical clues that you might have. If just Even if you just look at that right there and you know the history that a cataract was taken out and uh, the vision didn't get any better and you're just looking at that right there, what, what's something that maybe, what are some things that maybe stand out to you? Uh, 20, 2060 vision, 
farm the home it is, your cup to dish should be a lot bigger than point six. Absolutely, absolutely. It's just not, that just doesn't fit, does it? You know, central, that's a great point, central vision loss due to glaucoma is, you almost never, you never say always, it's almost always associated with a really bad nerve. I mean, just really bad. This nerve looked less cupped than the other eye, actually, okay? So that's a great clue, central vision loss that's disproportionate to optic nerve findings, okay? That nerve looked, I mean, maybe a long time ago, but was there any pallor, like, to that nerve? Not a lot, not a lot. Now, one of the things that I will say this, that you know how when a, you got a pseudophagic eye and a fakie eye, and you're comparing a pseudophagic eye to a fakie eye, the optic nerve on the pseudophagic side like always looks like it's got pallor relative to the optic nerve, and so or relative to the optic nerve on the fakie side, you know, because you get those uh, the effect of the cataract. Uh, so maybe we were just uh, noticing that, but it, pallor didn't really didn't really stand out to us. So you know, this patient, big tumor. Uh, referred on to surgery. And um, so let's just think of this normal pressure glaucoma. When, you, when you've got um, normal pressures, you've got optic nerve disease, what are, the, what are the, some of the things that you would look for clinically that might lead you to scan a patient, or to work them up, scan a patient, rather than just initiating treatment maybe for glaucoma? What, what would be some of the clinical findings that would lean towards imaging? Large asymmetry. What's that? Asymmetry. Asymmetry is huge. Yep. That might, well, neural field, I have that one. Asymmetry is one of the ones I have up here. What are some of the others? We saw a field, right? That, did, that didn't quite look like glaucoma, right? It just, just didn't quite look like it. So that's going to tip you over. Uh, asymmetry, absolutely. That's one of the biggest. In Utah, what's the number one cause of really asymmetric glaucoma? Yes. Exfoliation, absolutely. So one of the things that I think is really important is that when you got a patient there, see, so often the patient's going to come to you and they're very asymmetric, and if they've got exfoliation and they're already on three drops, you know, um, one of the most important things, I think, is to go back in their records, all right? And it just takes a little time to get the old records. And, if you, and you can find that, well, five years ago, when they first came in to that doctor, they came in and their pressure in this left pseudophagic eye, or uh, exhalation eye was 42, okay? I, I, you're done, you're done looking there. You don't have to go look for another cause of optic neuropathy because their pressure used to be 42. But when you look back and you, they've never had a very high pressure, that asymmetry in, in, the, in, the, in the presence of not having a documented high pressure, absolutely worrisome. A neural field, central vision loss, like in this lady right here, central vision loss that is disproportionate to optic nerve cupping is, that's, a, that's definitely a red flag, okay? Yeah, unilateral or asymmetric. And no history of old trauma or uh, elevated intraocular pressure. So sometimes you have to dig through some records to get to that. What about on this side? What, what would be findings against imaging? A notch. A notch, excellent. So in studies that have been done where they look at really experienced glaucoma observers and they're analyzing optic nerves and they're trying to determine, um, you know, is it glaucoma or not? A, the presence of a focal notch is like, like darn near pathognomonic of glaucoma, okay? So if I look back there and there's this focal notch and everything seems to correspond and their vision's still like, you know, 2025 or something like that, that really makes me think mostly glaucoma. Along with uh, a disc hemorrhage, that's another thing that is really common in normal tension glaucoma and really there's not anything else that does that, okay? Um, and then again, if you've got a previous, you know, you look back in the records and the pressure was 42 when they first saw their their uh, doctor. Okay, very good. Any questions about that? I think those are good cases to you know, kind of think about managing normal pressure glaucoma, and then of course classic visual field. All for, right. So for normal tension glaucoma, they they classically have like central visual field defects compared to like primary open angle glaucoma. Classically speaking, yes. I mean that's the classic teaching that normal pressure glaucoma patients tend to have 
like more paracentral defects, closer to fixation than high pressure glaucoma, but they're still not usually associated with vision loss, like, like acuity loss until, until quite late, okay? So I wanted to talk about uh, some things with this patient right here. So this is a patient, came in, nice fellow. And he's been, you know, managed, uh, you know, by, uh, on the outside. And he came to us, and, and we'll, we'll look at when, when this patient came to us. But, so this is a patient that has had pressures in this range, and their vision was 2050, and they had a two plus cataract, and this was before they came to us. And so they were on drops already, and they had SLT, and they had the visual field going from the first one to the second one. So the first one to the second one uh, is on the outside, and pressure was too, too high, the vision was 2050, had a cataract, and this patient had a mixed procedure. I think, you know, I think that's very, very appropriate. Give that a try. I had a mixed procedure. But they had some elevated intraocular pressure afterwards, wondering if maybe it was a steroid effect, okay? But the bottom line is that they progressed from the second field to the third field after their phaco eye stent, okay? So I think you could, everyone can look at that and you look at that and you say, that, that's getting worse, right? That, that, that's getting worse. So then they came to us, this patient came to us, and we had a long talk, and we decided to go ahead with a mitomycin trabeculectomy, okay, in this right eye. Now, the reason I want to bring this up is, and this is something that I think is just so important when you're going to manage glaucoma patients, and here's the thing. Even with that much visual field loss, that patient, other than the 2050, now, they do have better vision now, okay, but they're still progressing. You know, that patient is amazingly asymptomatic with even that much visual field loss. And so one of the most challenging things about managing glaucoma is that you are, to a large degree, dealing with an asymptomatic disease, okay? and you're trying to help them understand, I know it's asymptomatic, but it's getting worse. And if we don't do something different, it's gonna keep getting worse, all right? And I, like I say, I've, I've become very philosophical about this relationship, uh, not to get too personal, but as I've dealt with my own cancer diagnosis, it's, it's very similar. I have pretty much a, to my knowledge, I have not had a single symptom from my cancer, but I've had tons of symptoms from the treatment of my cancer. And glaucoma is very similar, okay? You can, you, you, these patients, they, many of them feel like they just see fine, okay? And yet you're telling them you need to have surgery. And that sometimes can be a hard thing. And that's really where, that's the art of medicine right there, and the art of being a a doctor in just the fullest sense of the word is helping that patient understand you know the nature of their disease and I know it's not I know you're not having symptoms I know you think you see fine one of the things that I like I mean visual fields get a lot of uh, negative press but one of the things that I really like about visual fields is in that Right there, you are sitting there in the room with the patient, and you just bring that screen up right there, and they go, "Whoa, okay, I got gotcha. you." All right, it's it's a very visual thing that helps the patient understand, you know, what they've got going on, and getting that buy-in from the patient, especially if you're going to talk about doing some of the more invasive glaucoma surgeries, getting that buy-in. You just, you just have to have it. Even, I will say this, even if you have to delay a little bit to get them to, to buy in to what needs to get done, it's worth it, believe me, it's worth it to have the patient, you know, kind of you and the patient be in agreement that we need to do this. So information like this, especially if you're gonna do a trabeculectomy or a valve or something like that, that will help you sleep at night because let's say something doesn't go well, okay? Let's say there's a problem. Well, you can look back at that visual field 
chart right there, and you can say, well, this, this patient was going blind. I mean, we had to do something, okay? And the patient can do that as well. And one of the things that I always tell the patient, and I believe it, I mean, it's, 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 I, I absolutely believe it. I never recommend surgery to somebody, especially if it's like a trab or a tube. I never recommend surgery to them unless I fully believe that the risk of doing the procedure is less than now the risk of not doing it, okay? And things like the age of the patient really weigh into that, right? I mean, this visual field, that, that sequence right there, you're gonna have a very different conversation with someone who's 95 versus someone who's 65, okay? But getting that, that rapport and getting that relationship and getting that buy-in from the patient is so important. And visual fields help you do that, okay? And, and so use them in, in that way. So this patient had a TRAB, and they did well, but about 10 months later, their pressure had crept up a little bit up into the kind of the upper teens again. And so we needed to do, we did a revision of that trabeculectomy and now we're sitting good. Pressure is seven and vision's 20, 30 and you know, we're feeling, feeling good about things, okay? Now, this same patient, this is their left eye, okay? This is their left eye. Pressure's again between 19 and 22. Vision was 20, 25. They just had a small little cataract. Uh, on drops, SLT was done. And this is the visual field sequence that we're watching here, okay? Um, any thoughts on that? What's the time interval between those eight? So uh, this is actually not that long. This is just uh, January of 2020 at the top and September of 2020 down at the bottom. So that's not a very long interval. That's a very good question. It's less than a year. of this eye and also the other eye, I think. I don't know. It might be better to be aggressive since this is a good seeing eye. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I, I couldn't, couldn't agree more. Uh, and, and the reason I wanted to bring this up is this person had a trabeculectomy. The patient asked for it. Okay. Now, I would say, yeah, we, ha we got a good result on the other side, and that's, that's, that helps. But I would just argue that that is kind of about you know, getting, building this relationship with your patient that they can then, you know, just know that you are their advocate and you're going to do their very best and they're going to, yeah, let's do this. So basically the patient adopted exactly the philosophy that, that you expressed there. And that's what, that's what we want, okay? We want that kind of relationship. And um, that's really when I, like, I know, I'll, I'll just t tell you this. So you know, when I was talking to my doctor about, you know, what, what are we going to do here? And, um, and they said to me a very important phrase, and, and it kind of goes along with this idea that I have that I, I don't recommend surgery unless I feel the risk of doing the surgery is less than not doing it. Uh, my doctor said to me, hey, Norm, he said, you need to start thinking about this in terms of surviving this thing and not worrying about side effects. And that's, you know, I needed to be told that. And so, you know, that's just part of that relationship, that partnering that you they have with the doctor. And so if you're going to treat glaucoma, uh, just encourage you to really work on developing that kind of relationship. It's a, it's a partnership. And to make sure that the patient is on board with what you're asking them to do. And a big part of that is because you're dealing with this asymptomatic disease. I'll guarantee you, that, that fellow's got no symptoms from that. Right? He's got zero symptoms from that visual field defect. Okay? So again, not trying to be too existential, but I just, uh, it's just such an important thing when you're going to take care of these patients and want to do it just the very best you can. Yes? I have another question. How low would you like the IOP to be? Because I didn't really find numbers on kind of the lower end, and seven on the other eye is probably what we want, but what would be the lowest number to prevent hypotony? Um, because if they come back with an IOP of two, that yeah. would be too low. No so good, where yeah. Is your limit on so that? that's a great question, and I, boy, I'd love to be able to just dial that in, you know. I'll take a nine on this person, you know, and I'd love to do that, and you can't, can't do that. But let me just, um, I'm going to bring up another patient here in the context of that question, okay? So I had a gentleman that I met for the first time just yesterday, and 14 years ago, he had a trabeculectomy. And, um, 
just met him yesterday, and he had a, a terrible experience with it. And, and his pressure went super low. He had a ton of vision loss. And he, and again, I'm not, not criticizing anybody, but you know, the trap didn't look very good, um, and he'd had vision loss. And he said to me, he said, that is the worst decision I've ever made in my life was to have this surgery. And then he said, another thing he said, you know, I think the only reason they wanted to do it was to get me off some of my drops. So I would say, and I mean, it breaks my heart to hear, to hear that, you know, from somebody, because I'm sure somebody had good intentions. But, but I would say there's two things to learn from that. Number one, again, I don't mean to criticize, but I would say that that's, there was not enough understanding between patient and doctor there about what they were trying to accomplish, okay? I mean, I, I don't do trabeculectomies just to get somebody off drops. You know, that's just too big, a, too big a thing, unless they can't take any drops. I mean, they're intolerant and their pressure off drops is 30 or something. That's a different story. But um, to do a trab just because someone doesn't like their drops or something like that, I don't know that I've ever done that. Um, but but to, you just have to build that relationship. You have to get the patient to buy in. And, and the patient to understand, okay, I know I've got to do this, okay? But the second thing to learn from, from that is that in trabeculectomy surgery, valve surgery too, but tra trabeculectomy especially, avoiding the low pressure is a super big goal. And so, you know, I'm not doing surgery anymore, but, you know, for 25 years of doing surgery and 25 years of doing trabeculectomy, so much of it was to just try to refine the technique so that we avoided the hypotenuse because that's where the disasters come from most of the time. Pressure goes too low and you get maculopathy, you get choroidals and all that kind of stuff and you know things are never going to be the same. So if you're going to do trabeculectomy and if you're going to do glaucoma, you're going to have to, at least for right now, we still got to do trabeculectomy. Um, having a way to avoid the hypotenuse and to titrate the pressure from the top down. So. At, when I do surgery, the, the ideal for me is like on day one or something, the pressure is like 18 or 20 or something like that. And then we're going to titrate it down by cutting stitches and we're going to take it down easy. That's the way we like to do it. Now, as far as what kind of pressure I would like to have for this person, well, I would say this, is that even though the pressure, based on visual field, we need lower pressure on that side, based on the history of the left eye, I would say we're at least aiming like low teens, if not you know, 10 or something, because we know their other eye went really bad with pressures kind of in the mid-teens, okay? And the other thing is that just because the pressure's low doesn't mean they have hypotonia. I know that sounds defensive from a glaucoma guy, but just because the pressure's low doesn't mean it's a bad thing. In fact, I will tell people if they come in and the pressure's four and they have good vision and no choroidals and no maculopathy, I say, this is the best thing that could ever happen to you to have a very low pressure and have your eye be able to tolerate it, okay? Love that. Certainly, some do get hypotony change and you have to be dealt with, but avoiding hypotony, I think, is the key to glaucoma, to doing trabeculectomy. I had a, a colleague, as, as we talked about this, uh, talking about with a colleague, I had, uh, he said to me, he said, um, so you would rather have a trabeculectomy fail than deal with hypotony? And yes, I would. I mean, hypotony is that bad of a thing, okay? I'd rather hover around the too high end rather than go real hypotenuse. I would. Okay. Great. Any other questions about, about any of that? Okay. Very good. Uh, now, he's got a pressure six. Ouch. But 2025, love it. Fantastic, you know. Um, fantastic. So he's, he's doing well. Okay. Exfoliation syndrome. So... The normal pressure glaucoma patients that are pressures are 10 or 11 and they're going down the drain, they're going to keep you up at night, sorry. But this is the other set that's going to do that because exfoliation can just misbehave so badly. And you know it from cataract surgery, right? I mean, that's a, that's a real thing. You know, exfoliation cataracts are they're a different beast than, than a regular cataract surgery. Well, exfoliation glaucoma is a, is a different beast than regular glaucoma, and I'll, I'll show you some examples. So what do you think of as the clinical features, the main clinical features of exfoliation disease? That you see on exam. The most obvious is 
exfoliation of material on yeah. the lens capsule. On the lens capsule. So that's, that's number one. And uh, so, yeah, you always look for that. So what are some of the other clinical findings, though? Because oftentimes a patient's going to come to you and they might be treated for glaucoma or maybe just have high pressure and they're pseudophagic, right? So what are some of the other clinical signs you can look for to make the diagnosis of exfoliation disease? TIDs. Absolutely. TIDs. That's a very good one. And where are those TIDs? Usually, is it peripheral? So I think... Pupillary margin? Pupillary margin. I think of them pupillary margin, mid-peripheral <laughs> ones, the pigmentary, okay? <laughs> yeah. So any other thoughts? Yeah, excellent. That's a really important one. They have a very characteristic angle on gonioscopy, okay? They very commonly have a sampleases line, but they also, it almost looks like kind of an inflammatory angle. It's not, but it's, it looks kind of junky. I just kind of describe it at that. I mean, it's, the TM's not like really smooth, and you know, it just looks like it's kind of funky. And so they have, you know, and it's kind of one of those gestalt, ophthalmology, as you know, ophthalmology exam, a lot of it's just kind of gestalt, you just, well, that's it. That's exfoliation. I've seen that a thousand times. I, you know, I know what it looks like. Um, that's kind of the angle of exfoliation patients. It kind of looks. It just looks like an exfoliation patient. There's one other thing that I was, so TIDs. They can have. They can have pigment on the endothelium. They can. They could exfoliate. Absolutely. That that's a that's a really big one. The only one other one I'd, I'd say that I actually think for me is the most important. And that is the appearance of the iris margin, the pupillary margin. It has kind of that, again, it's a kind of that gestalty look. It's that kind of scruffy, um, it's not real smooth, and you just look at it and you go, wow, that's an exfoliation iris, you know? And uh, so the appearance of the pupillary margin, just right off of that, the TIDs, uh, kind of a junky angle. I know these words are ridiculous, but that's just kind of how I describe it. And of course, if you see it on the lens, then you got it made, but oftentimes they'll be pseudophagic, okay? So those clinical features, because it's really important to know if your patient has exfoliation. It's really important because you just gotta be careful with it. So let's take this patient right here. You got a 79 year old uh, white man, vision's 25, 20, 20, pressure's 24 and 20, exfoliation on the right. And we, we've made that diagnosis, you know, based on he's pseudophagic, but we can look at our other findings that we just talked about, and we can make that diagnosis of that exfoliation. He's on three drops in the right eye, one drop in the left eye. Left eye does not have exfoliation, by the way, it's the, just in the right eye. Cup to disc of 0 0.7 and 0.4, all right? These are his fields, okay? And I know that um, there, there's, a, there's a fair amount of distance between the middle one and the lower in terms of time. You know, there's like you know, three, four years there, and I realize that's quite a bit. And I'm sorry that the bottom one got kind of cut off there. But what I wanted to emphasize is that exfoliation eyes can just go bad in a real hurry. And I, we don't understand everything about exfoliation, but I, just based on your clinical experience, these nerves just seem really susceptible to damage and to, to doing poorly. And it can happen really fast. It can happen frighteningly fast. You know, I've seen easily, I've seen that much change in an exfoliation patient in six months. And uh, it's, it's really kind of a, a scary thing um, to see. And I, the reason I bring it up is because I think in a, in, a, in a perfect world, we would follow exfoliation patients like every, like every three to four months. I mean, things can change so fast. But the practical reality is we, we can't really do that. But if, if you have an exfoliation page, just have in your mind, this, this, things can go bad here pretty quickly, and I need to be, need to be careful about it. Yeah? I don't quite still understand why pseudoexfoliation is often so asymmetric, because it's like theoretically a systemic disease. I know. Do you, I don't know if I, any, I don't know the answer. Now, now, certainly, you know, a certain percentage do go on to become bilateral, but there's a huge number that just stay unilateral. And I, I do not have a, a good answer for that, um, you know, why, why that's the case. But it's certainly clinically true. Um, so, yeah. I actually read something that about uh, the side of the bed you sleep on may have a correlation with uh, the de deposition of I, I've heard that too, I've heard that too. And, uh, and you know, there's, there's, there's things that are brought out by exfoliation, like 
um, uh, kind of your, um, your latitude, you know, like further away from the equator, they think that there's some environmental factors. And, you know, it kind of, if you just look at the, the demographics of exfoliation and where, where it's found most commonly, it, it is in these kind of populations that uh, kind of live away from the poles, or, oh, I'm sorry, away from the equator. Um, so there's some pre actually pretty darn good studies about uh, showing people that always sleep on one side, and especially if they sleep with like their hand up, that they can get asymmetric glaucoma in that eye that they're always on. Now, not necessarily exfoliation, but, but just glaucoma in general. So, isn't isn't like uh, the degree of exfoliation not correlated to the degree of glaucoma? Not at all. So, yeah, not okay. at all. I, I agree. It, no, I mean, yeah, you, you can you, you can see horrible ones that just seem to have the most subtle exfoliation. And others that are just like throwing that stuff all over their anterior chamber and they're doing just fine. So, so it's on UV exposure to and laterality exfoliation, I believe. Yeah, uh, UV exposure, you say? Yeah. yeah. Like out of car window on yeah. one side? Yeah. So I've read that uh, patients with pseudo exfoliation syndrome have greater diurnal fluctuations. In Europe, we admit patients overnight to measure their diurnal spikes. Yeah. Would this be something that would even be considered in the United States for a patient with pseudorex? Or would it, like, is this just something that we don't do? Or would that be a helpful, like, additional yeah. uh, tool to see do we need to do laser to get their pressure lower? Yeah, so, you know, a diurnal fluctuation would be great to get on everybody. And, um, and exfoliation patients, perhaps, especially. And I know that in, in the United States, so when I was a resident, I, I'm sure you hate to have phrases start with that, when I was a resident. But when I was a resident, I was in Iowa, I can't even begin to, you know, Sohan Hay Ray had us doing dial curves on everybody. And so it was like, anytime you're on call, it was just, they would just line up these patients and they would keep them in the clinical study center there and you would just be checking pressures all night long. <laughs> so, um, the ability to, so here's, here's just the reality of that. It, no, no American insurance covers that at all anymore, and so it just kind of doesn't happen that much, quite frankly. Uh, but, but we used to do that tons, tons of those patients. So it would be good. Now, uh, one of these days I can show you, I have, I have this patient that um, I call my most instructive patient ever that I've ever had, that I've learned more from this patient than any other single patient I've ever had. And what made it possible is that he bought a home tonometer. And he basically did diurnals all day. He was, he was super compulsive, but in a, really, in, a, in, a, in a really nice way, a really helpful way, you know. He's just a great guy. I, lo I love him, and, and he's, uh, he's taught me so much. But he has, like, done a few hundred diurnals on himself, you know. And, uh, but then watching what happened to those curves after we did a trabeculectomy and et cetera, it's just, it's just absolutely fascinating, okay? So it would be great. And I think uh, the ability to measure pressure at home, once that becomes really widely available and, and very reproducible, that's gonna be maybe one of the single biggest changes that, that you all experience, I think, in your lives of managing glaucoma patients is the ability to get lots of pressure readings at home and then analyze the data. Okay, good. So what are we going to do for this, for this patient? Let me just remind you here. Pressure of 24 is on three drops, and it's got this going on. What do you think? What would be? What's that? Is he faking? Is she faking? He is, let me see. Um, he's faking, I believe. Yeah. SLT? Reasonable? I agree. What about what about SLT in exfoliation disease? Uh, looks extra well. Uh huh. <clears throat> Short lasting. Yeah, yeah. What it, what is one thing that I think, and and we actually published a paper on this, that I think you have to be really careful with, especially in exfoliation, and doing SLT. Uh, spikes. Yes. And what makes them more common? I don't mean to pimp yet, but it just. Okay, what about the technique? 
you're right about that. But what about the technique might make it more common? All at once. Doing 360. Doing 360. And, and also at high power. But 360. So exfoliation patients, I'm doing SLT. I only do 180 degrees at, at a time. And, I, and that's pretty much I always do that. We had a series here several years ago. Um, and one of the patients was, was mine. Six of them were referred in to me. They all had exfoliation. And they all had 360 degree SLT. And they all did horrible. Um, with pressure spikes, three of them lost their corneas as part of it too, and multiple of them had to have surgery. So that was uh, that was a real you know eye opener. And so I only do 180 degrees, and I, I might recommend that to you all. But SLT and exfoliation, probably pigmentary as well. Uh, just do 180 degrees at a time. But you're right; it does tend to work better in pigmented angles. Certainly, that was true of ALT, but it's true of SLT as well. Okay, what about surgery in this patient? And if so, what kind of surgery? What about what about phaco migs in this this uh, uh, population? What's that? The migs can get clogged again. You can, you can. So when you think of exfoliation, and, and you, you, we heard Dr. Ahmed, you know, give this great talk about migs, and and Dr. Ahmed brought out a really important point that I think is really, really been fascinating about the whole MIGS experience is that one of the most important things MIGS has taught us is about the importance of what we might call downstream resistance, okay? That you can bypass, you know, the TM, but if you've got bad downstream resistance, like if you think of the Goldman equation, right, there's that, just that tagged on term of episcleral venous pressure. Episcleral venous pressure, in, in, because of MIGS, we've learned that is so complicated. It's more than just episcleral venous pressure. It's, I think we'll probably even someday change that term to downstream resistance, meaning everything that resists aqueous outflow beyond the TM and Schlem's canal, okay? So exfoliation, I think of as a TM disease, kind of like pigmentary. I mean, you've got this membranous junk that's kind of clogging up the TM, and so if you can bypass that, uh, you can get some genuine benefits. So I actually think MIGS works really quite well in exfoliation and in pigmentary, and especially well in like steroid glaucoma, because steroid glaucoma is a TM glaucoma. And that's why it doesn't, I don't think MIGS work that well in good old POAG, right? Because I think what we're finding is that so much of POAG is a downstream disease. Does that make sense? So I, I like MIGS and exfoliation. So I think that's absolutely something to consider. In this patient, though, again, for the same reason that SLT might not be the best thing, that, 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 that's a pretty bad field. And MIGS might not be enough. But I don't think it would be out of the question, especially if your patient felt, I do not want to do a trabeculectomy. Okay, I'm not, I'm not there yet. And uh, so I think MIGS is reasonable, and I think a good good chance, reasonable chance, expectation that you'd have some good benefit from these, okay? Trabeculectomy, anything special about trabeculectomy in exfoliation? Any, any thoughts that come to your mind? Not as well, but it closes very. What's that? It closes quicker than in the general population, but it works well generally, initially. I think that's exactly right. I, I think that, so if I think of some of the hardest patients that I have, this is just, again, just kind of an anecdotal, but you know, I've been doing this a lot. Um, some of the hardest group of patients that I have to get a trabeculectomy to work are elderly women that have exfoliation. I don't know why, but I can almost count on it being difficult, okay? They, they, they just tend to scar down. Now, I still do a lot of trabeculectomy and exfoliation disease, but I will say, Man, we have to work at uh, quite a few of them, and there's quite a few of them that end up needing a valve. Okay, and uh, so trabeculectomy, I just don't think it's quite as successful in exfoliation disease as it is, as it is in POAG. Okay, valve. I, I, a lot of exfoliation patients that are doing poorly end up with valves. Some of them after failed trabeculectomy, some of them uh, get a valve as primary treatment, but. Um, a lot of valves going into exfoliation patients. All right. 
let me just go back one more time. So let me, I, I know this is not a cataract surgery talk, but y'all like cataract surgery. So cataract surgery in exfoliation disease, what are, what are some of the things you might think of that you might do differently if you're doing an exfoliation patient? The capsule can uh -huh, absolutely. So you're going to be really careful with capsulorexis. You know, some people argue of maybe doing flax or something like that because of that, but, you know, I, uh, capsulorexis, you can do it, but you just need to be careful. I am a, uh, you know, we're all careful surgeons. I am kind of a crazy careful surgeon, and, um, and I, I try to really teach, uh, you know, fellows and residents about, you know, staying safe. And exfoliation, I, I always think about, uh, I never... I, I never want a resident or a fellow to ever use the word fast. I never want to hear the word fast as it relates to cataract surgery, okay? Um, that should never be a goal. Uh, speed and you can say efficiency, I, I, I love that word, but fast or quick or whatever, how fast did you do that? I, I, I never want to hear that word. Um, efficiency comes with experience. It, it's never in my opinion, never something to try to achieve. Does that make sense? I'm gonna do this really fast. It's efficiency comes with experience. And so I tend to work with very kind of slowish, meticulous movements. But in exfoliation, it's like even exaggerated, okay? We're just gonna turn the clock off on this case. We're gonna be efficient and we're gonna be smooth, but we're not gonna do anything fast or quick, okay? Another thing is I think that there is a very definite correlation between the laxity of the zonules in exfoliation and the pupillary dilation. Not always, but if you have an exfoliation patient but you still get this great big old pupil, I bet you're gonna be pretty good, okay? But if it's exfoliation and that pupil is going nowhere, just ding, 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 I'm gonna be really, really careful here, okay? Anything else you might do in exfoliation cataract? Yeah, like Aaron, I said, just being very careful with um, like bag stability and zonular weakness. Like I know with Dr. Chaya, he does not hesitate to at least put in capsular tension hooks. Hooks, yeah. Hooks. Yep. Uh, just for stability. And then if anything looks fishy, he'll put in a ring yep. or on med ring segments. Yeah. So he'll, he'll do the full shebang. Yeah. Absolutely. We have a lot of uh, things to, that we can use at our disposal, you know, that we, we didn't used to have. So that's great. That's great to use that. Um, another thing is when, if you're going to. So in my experience, if you're going to have problems with doing uh, exfoliation cataract, when is it most likely to occur? I think it's during the IA because you've kind of, you know, you've been working on the cataract and you've got it out and you're nice, but then you're, you're going to start tugging directly on those zonules and, and the cortical material of exfoliation could be kind of sticky. Y'all know that, right? I mean, it, can be sticky and a problem. I mean, it, it seems unfair that when you really need it to come right out, it doesn't, right? But um, so to make sure that when you're grabbing cortex, um, that you just don't grab the bag, and because it's easy to do both, but but you like to just make sure you get underneath and just get cortex, and then you know, kind of peel it off in that kind of circular motion to d diminish uh, effects on the zonules. But um, those are just some of the things that I think of. But if you're going to do glaucoma, you're just going to end up doing a lot of cataract surgery on exfoliation patients. Yeah, don't hesitate to use the tools that we have, but just kind of just slow motion, be just extra careful. Don't grab the bag with the IA, you know, things like that. All right, good. We're almost there. Sorry, I know this, I mean, this two hours are long, I know. Okay, pigmentary glaucoma. What are some of the things you... Uh, Think up with pigmentary glaucoma, demographics, clinical findings. What are what are some of the things on your mind? <sighs> What's that? I'm sorry. Young male. Yeah. Myopic. Young myopic males. That just boom. That's just who they are. Uh, I've seen it in women, but it uh, it's just so much less common, especially just in the clinic. You know, most pigmentary patients are young myopic males, and. Uh, what kind of symptoms can you have? You know, we talk about being asymptomatic. Pigmentary is actually a disease that can be pretty symptomatic. What are some of the symptoms that you can, can uh, elicit from patients that have pigmentary? That's absolutely true. So my co-resident, Bill Haynes at Iowa, is one of the guys that published most of the papers and, uh, on that. 
a subject and why? Well, that was him. He's a pigmentary patient, and he loved to play basketball, and he was like in lecture and going, wait a minute, that happens to me all the time. And so uh, Lee Allward examined him, and gosh, he had like terrible pigmentary. So uh, he did a lot of studies on it and, and wrote a lot of papers about it. So it's, it's kind of really good, but that's a totally real thing, especially after a jarring kind of exercise, something like basketball, okay? They can get these pressure spikes, and they can be super symptomatic. Anything else about pigmentary? What clinical signs that you that you see when you examine? Sampleosis line. Yep, definitely, almost always. Yeah, no, and not only sampleosis line, but what does the TM look like? It's like a, it's like a crayon. It is so, just, yeah, it almost like looks thick. You know, it's like wow, that is that is some kind of TM. And sampleosis line. What, what else do you see? What's that? Yeah, mid peripheral TIDs, almost always there. Yeah, yeah, Kruger So those are all. Yeah, it's really a, it's really an interesting disease. I mean, those those clinical findings are really, really very interesting. Um, pathogenesis is thought to be what? Yeah, so that's another thing to look for on gonio is that posterior bowing. That's like the, the telltale sign of, of pigmentary. Rubs against the zonules, gives you the TI translumination defects. You know, liberates the pigment. Pigment clogs up to TM. Very good. So those are the signs that, that you're going to find. What about treatment? What are some of the things that you think of when you're going to start thinking about treating a pigmentary patient? Quick question on the previous. Yeah. Uh, you just see some endopigment, maybe in a Greenberg spindle formation, but nothing else. How often do you start thinking about uh, PDS and start running after that? Often. Yeah, often. Especially if it's in that distribution, you know, it's just not that very much. Especially that patient's a little older, because I, th I, I believe that this kind of burned out pigmentary thing is a real thing. And they actually can start kind of, uh, you know, uh, having less pigment on their cornea, less pigment in their angle, but they're just an older pigmentary patient. So I think, I think that's pretty real. Excellent. Uh, treatment. What, what uh, med medically, what works really well in pigmentary patients? Far as a, far as a drop. So, what what is is pigmentary a TM disease? Yeah. Pigmentary is a TM disease. Absolutely, aqueous suppressants absolutely work. What's even better? PGA. Yeah, the prostaglandins. So it, it really does. Prostaglandins, I think, have a huge impact in pigmentary. They they do in almost everybody, but a really big impact because you know you open up that uh, that uh, episclerovenous or uh, the uh, secondary outflow pathway. And uh, they tend to really have a positive response to um, prostaglandin analogs. Another one is pilocarpine. That you, you all might not even heard of pilocarpine. <laughs> pilocarpine <laughs> used to be something we would use a lot. The only problem is, is that pigmentary patients are also the ones that can't stand pilocarpine because they're myopic, and it makes them even more myopic, and it, it's really difficult. But um, you know, it works like a charm in these patients. It also flattens out the iris pretty dramatically and might help with the pathogenesis of it. But, uh, you know, we just don't use it very much because of the side effects. But prostaglandins are your number one thing. SLT in these patients? Yeah. T you know, this is the classic, uh, um, you know, disease where SLT, ALT can be very, very effective. Again, I would just treat 180 degrees at one time. Okay. Um, surgery, MIGs. A lot of the same things seems th same things we said about exfoliation and MIGs and stuff apply with pigmentary. It can be super effective, okay, uh, in in patients with pigmentary because you just get them a little bypassed by all this TM disease, and they can do really well. So I'm, I'm quick to do that whenever possible. Trab and valve. I actually I think trabs in this in this population work significantly better than in the exfoliation patient. But what do you have to be careful of? What, it's already been said. What, what about these patients makes them more potentially problematic with trabeculectomy? They're myopic. Excellent. They're myopic. And so you just have to be really careful with that. And how do you, you tie your sutures tighter? I mean, it's, that's what you do. You know, when, I, when I'm in the OR, I'm doing a trab, I'm tying my sutures tight. I, the perfect kind of tension for me is when I kind of reinflate the eye in the OR to physiologic IOP and I get 
like zero flow or maybe just an absolute trickle. Anything more than that, I'm going to shut it down. But what I love is when I inflate the eye to physiologic pressure, I get like no pressure, or excuse me, no flow, but I just put a teeny little bit of pressure on the posterior lip of the wound, and I get a pretty good gush of fluid. So you're just like right at that, you know, balance point between almost no outflow and a lot of outflow. That, that's where I like to leave it, right there. And, and especially in myopic patients, um, I, the tidal sutures down. If, I, if I'm going to err, though, I'm going to err on the side of too tight because I can correct that, right? Okay, uh, valve, same. Uh, I know we're out of time. Inflammatory glaucoma, uh, very common. And, you know, is it inflammation or is it steroid? You're always asking yourself that question. Which one is it, you know? Is, and, and sometimes you don't know exactly. But they, they tend to kind of respond the same. But balancing that can be, can be kind of tricky. Treatment, um, medicines, what kind of medicines do you tend to think of with inflammatory glaucoma? Like pulling off the shelf first that might not be what you would normally do. Well, if it's, if it's, oh, sorry, Bert. Go ahead. Oh, if it's truly really inflammatory, then usually you do want to use steroid? Like if it's acutely inflammatory? Absolutely, no question, then yeah. you do want to use steroid? No question. Because Get it quieted down. And, exactly. you know, the, the UVI folks will tell you that we've got, you know, I know they're on every two hour steroids and they're a steroid responder, but we've got to get the inflammation out. And I totally agree. So you're going to treat them with steroids if the eye's hot. How about pressure lowering? Drops. I was just thinking you avoid crossing my eyes. That is absolutely right. Tend to. Now, if it were my eye and I had inflammatory glaucoma and it was either try this latanoprost or have a trabeculectomy, I'm going to try the latanoprost. <laughs> but, um, I probably am not going to pull that off the shelf first, where in almost everybody else, I'm going to pull the latanoprost off first. Usually aqueous suppressants first in the inflammatory glaucomas, okay? So that's a couple things about medicine. Laser. What's that? Consider avoiding. Yes. I, I, I you just never say never, but I rarely do any laser trabeculoplasty in a inflammatory patient. But now here's, here's the thing though, is an SLT works great in steroid glaucoma, okay? So if, if you think it's mostly steroid induced, all right, laser actually works really, really well. But sometimes making that differentiation is tough. But in a truly inflammatory glaucoma, I don't do laser. Then what about surgery? Um, MIGS? MIGS can be great. I mean, this is, this is where MIGS can be absolutely fantastic. And by MIGS, I just mean like goniotomy, uh, something very simple. Um, there's some, one of the a series of papers that I came across that had a dramatic practice changing impact on me was looking at uh, David Walton's papers on doing goniotomy in younger patients with inflammatory glaucoma. I mean, a straight goniotomy, just like you do in a baby. 23 gauge needle, just boom, cut the, you know, cut the TM open. It works fantastically well. And so if you have a young patient with inflammatory glaucoma, especially if it's like JRA, and they haven't had a lot of other surgery, like they haven't been vitrectomized and all that, boy, think of like a, just a straight goniotomy in those patients, beautiful. That's my favorite glaucoma surgery, just a straight goniotomy. It's, so physiologic, it's just a, just a beautiful thing. But other MIGs, you know, be it, uh, be it GAT or ABIC or something like that, you know, in the GAT studies, this is the, these are the patients where GAT works the best, is in the inflammatory glaucoma patients. So really think of MIGs. Uh, so going on ahead there. Trabeculectomy, okay. Trabeculectomy in inflammatory glaucoma. What are the concerns? Scarring. Scarring, yes. And it also can be the opposite. They can have not, they can not scar that much. So hypotony in general is a real concern in inflammatory glaucoma. And so when I'm doing a trabeculectomy in a definite uveitic patient, I'm gonna tie the sutures tighter. Because not only do they sometimes have yucky sclera and conge that doesn't form much scar tissue, Okay, but they can also very definitely be hyposecretors. They just don't secrete as much aqueous because their ciliary body is always inflamed. All right? So you have a lot of factors 
that are kind of pushing towards hypotenuse, you want to be really careful. Now, because of that, inflammatory patients get a lot of valves also. And what kind of valves are we going to use in an inflammatory patient? We're going to use a valved valve, okay? <laughs> a double valve, but not a, what are the, what are the unvalved cetons? Bearvelt, Maltinos, okay? Uh, the, new one, the new one from uh, New World Medical. So I don't put in unvalved cetons in uveitic patients, especially if they've had a lot of sub t non okay? I mean, th this, is, this is definitely something to write down. Don't do an unvalved valve in a patient that's had a lot of sub t non And why is that? They will not form a cap. They just won't. And as soon as that you know, ligature uh, opens up, you're going to have a hypotenuse flat eye. It's a, it's a mess. And uh, that's uh, Lee Allward uh, told me that. And you know, he's just one of those things. He just said, take it from me. I learned it the hard way. Just don't do it. And so I, I've never done it. So I always use an Ahmed, a valved valve, in my patients with uveitis. And even then, I flow restrict it, OK? And the way I flow restrict a valve is I put a 5-O-proline in the lumen. And then I tie a 7 o tight around that 5 uh, proline tight, cut it, and then I pull that proline out. So basically, the tube is now like an hourglass, and it's, it's constricted at that one spot to about the size of a 5 proline lumen, okay? And, and that's, if you're really worried about hypotony, like somebody that's super myopic or a uveitic patient that has bad inflammatory disease, you want to not get hypotony even with a valve valve, doing that flow restriction can make, that, that can be a lifesaver, so. It will, then... absolutely. But you don't get the big rush like you do in an unbound valve. It's much more subtle than that. But yes, it does eventually open up. That's right. That is it. So thanks, everybody. I really appreciate your time. And uh, you know, glaucoma? Glaucoma's good. It's a tough disease. <laughs> but it's a good thing. And uh, just, just, you know, when you're treating glaucoma, you're treating real disease, you know. And so that always helps you. Uh, you know, treat <laughs> uh, Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, take those bagels if you want. If you want them up in the resident room or whatever, feel free. We'll take them to the resident room. Yeah, yeah. Or wherever. I'm not going to be here right now.
So that's why you yes. know, people get oh, like, in movie um, theaters. Two weeks. Right. Nice. Yeah. And then turn lights on. Partially died. Yeah. And they're off this. And that's when oh. it turns. Okay. Right. <laughs> so Love it. <laughs> I had a good time. To hopefully get her out of this. This is very awkward. And then literally pull the iris out of the 